Chapter six, part one of Christian Non Resistance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter six, part one of Christian Non Resistance in All Its Important Bearings, Illustrated and Defended by Aidan Ballou. Chapter six, General Objections Answered. The present chapter will be devoted to the consideration and removal of sundry common objections to the doctrine of Christian non-resistance. Objection 1. Impracticable till the Millennium. Your doctrine may be true in its principles and in its ultimate requirements, but it must be impracticable till the Millennium. Then, when the whole human race shall have become regenerate, its sublime morality will be the spontaneous development of all hearts. Under existing circumstances, while there is so much depravity, and such multitudes of men are restlessly bent on aggression, it is obviously impracticable. The wicked would shortly exterminate the righteous, were the latter to act on non-resistant principles. Answer. I affirm the exact contrary, viz. that the righteous would exterminate the wicked in the best sense of the word, were they to act on strict non-resistant principles. They would immediately usher in the millennium, with all its blessings, were they to act on these principles in true and persevering fidelity. How else is it imaginable that any such state as the millennium should ever be developed among mankind? Is it to come arbitrarily and mechanically? Is it to come, with observation, the full-grown production of absolute miracle? Is not the kingdom of heaven within and among men, and thence, like leaven hid in three measures of meal, destined to ferment and rectify the whole mass? Ought not each true Christian's heart be a germ of the millennium, and each Christian community a proximate miniature of it? If not, what is the evidence that men have been born again, that there is any such thing as regeneration? If professing to be disciples of Christ, they are unable, even by divine grace, to practice the precepts of their Lord and Master, merely because the unregenerate around them are so wicked, what is their religion, their profession, their regeneration worth? The objection before us involves such extreme incongruities that it can be entertained only for a moment. Let us examine it. 1. It presupposes that Jesus Christ enjoined on his disciples duties for the whole period preceding the millennium, which he knew they could not perform until the arrival of the latter period, and yet gave them no intimation of that fact. 2. It presupposes that Jesus enjoined many particular duties for which there will be no possible occasion in the millennium, and which therefore can never be fulfilled. 3. It presupposes that the principles, dispositions, and moral obligations of men in the millennium will be essentially different from what the New Testament requires them to be now. Is there any doubt in respect to these three statements? It is certain that Jesus apparently inculcates his non-resistant precepts as now binding and practicable, and that he gives no intimation of their impracticability till some remote future period. Was this design, chance, or mistake? In either case, it derogates from the honor of the Redeemer. It is not to be presumed. It is equally certain, on the objector's theory, that Christ enjoined particular duties for which there can be no possible occasion in the millennium. In the millennium there will be no occasion to put in practice the precept, Resist not evil, for there will be no evildoers to forbear with. In that day there will be no occasion for a man, when smitten on one cheek, to turn the other when distrained of his coat, to give up his cloak, when persecuted and reviled, to bless, when trespassed upon, to forgive, and no occasion to love his enemy, do good to his hater, or pray for his injurer. For there will be none to harm or destroy in all God's holy mountain. There can be no occasion for non-resistance where there is no aggression, injury, or insult so that the objector virtually makes the Son of God appear in the highest degree ludicrous and absurd. He makes him say, Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. In the millennium, when there will be none. And if any man smite thee on thy right cheek, in the millennium, when all shall be love and kindness, turn unto him the other also. And whosoever will sue thee at the law, in the millennium, when the law of love shall be universally obeyed, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Love your enemies, 
in the millennium, when you have no enemies, bless them which curse you, when there are none to curse, do good to them that hate you, when all love you, forgive offenses, till seventy times seven, when offenses shall be unknown, feed your foes, when all are friends, and overcome evil with good, when no evil remains. These are sublime virtues which you are to practice, not now, when there are so many occasions for them, and when they might exert such a powerful influence in favor of my religion as contrasted with the spirits of this world, not now, for they are impracticable, the unbelieving world is too wicked for such an exemplification of righteousness, but in the millennium, then practice them, when you find no occasion for them, and when it will be absolutely impossible to fulfill them for want of an opportunity. For then all shall know and serve the Lord, from the least unto the greatest. Is the great teacher to be thus understood? Who will presume to say it? The third statement is also true. The objection presupposes that the principles, dispositions, and moral obligations of men in the millennium will be essentially different from what the New Testament requires them to be now. This is an error so fundamental and yet so common among professing Christians that it ought to be thoroughly exploded. Professor Upham has done this so effectually in his Manual of Peace that I cannot refrain from presenting my readers with the following excellent extract. Principles of the Millennium are we to expect a new code, a new system of methods of operation? Are we to expect a new Saviour, a new crucifixion, a new and amended edition of the New Testament? Certainly not. The doctrine of the millennium are the doctrines of today. The principles of the millennium are the very principles which are obligatory on the men of the present generation. The bond which will exclude all contention, and will bind together all hearts, will be nothing more nor less than the gospel of Christ. The Gospel is a book of principles, of great, operative, unchangeable principles. Men condemn it because they do not understand it. Even Christians may be fairly charged with treating it with no small degree of disregard, because, in their worldliness, they have neglected to estimate its heights and depths. If heaven could be brought down to the earth, if Europe and America and all other continents and parts of the world could, at present moment, be peopled with angels, and with seraphic natures, the gospel, just as it stands, would be sufficient to guide and govern them. The blessed companies of the heavenly world, unlike the children of men, would ask no higher and better code. But can we regard it as allowable, under any assignable circumstances, for an angel to retaliate upon an angel, for a seraph to exercise hostility upon a seraph, for one of these holy beings to hold in his own hands the right of extinguishing the life of another? What sort of heaven would that be, which should be characterized by the admission of such a principle? And we may ask, further, what sort of a millennium will that be, which shall be characterized, either practically or theoretically, in the same way? When men are fully restored to the favor of God, whether in heaven or earth, is there to be one code, one set of governmental principles for them, and another for other holy beings? Certainly not. In all the great matters of right and duty, the law of seraphs is the law of angels, and the law of angels is the law of men. If it is utterly and absolutely inconsistent with our conceptions of the heavenly world, that the power of life and death should be taken from the hands of Jehovah, and that angels and seraphs should have the right to extinguish each other's existence, it is equally difficult to conceive of such a right in the millennium. And if it will not be right for the men of the millennium to exercise the power of life and death over each other, it is not right for them now. We have the same code of government now, which we shall have then. We have the New Testament now, and we shall have it then. And not only that, we shall understand it better, and love it more. Nothing will be added to it, nothing will be taken from it. If it does not now consider human life inviolable, it never will. If it does not now prescribe all wars among human species, it never will. The right of taking human life, if it exists now under the Christian code, will exist as a legal and authorized characteristic, painful and even horrible as the mere thought is, of the pure, blessed, and angelic state of the millennium. On the supposition, therefore, that life will be inviolable in the millennium, and that it will not be considered right for one man to put another to death for any possible reason, we argue that it is not right now. This form of reasoning is applicable to any other analogous case whatever. If it will not be right to steal in the millennium, it is not right to steal now. 
if it will not be right to be intemperate in the millennium, it is not right to be intemperate now. If it will not be right to hold slaves in the millennium, it is not right to hold slaves now. If it will not be right to take life and carry on war in the millennium, it is not right to take life and carry on war now. The principles which will be acknowledged as authoritative in the millennium are the very principles which are prescribed and are binding upon us at the present moment. No change in principles is required, but merely a change in practice. If the practice of men should tomorrow be conformed to the principles which the finger of God has written on the pages of the New Testament, then tomorrow would behold the millennium. We delight to linger upon this subject. There is a charm in the millennial name, scribenti menium ingisit, et quam libe vestinantem in se morari cogit. The wing of poetry flags under this great conception. Sometimes we see it under the type of a wilderness newly clothed with bud and blossom. Sometimes we see it under the type of a city descending from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Sometimes we behold it as a great temple, arising out of the earth, and capacious enough to contain all nations. This temple is not built of earthly materials, that will perish with the using, but is supported on immutable columns. Every great moral and religious principle is a pillar in the millennial temple. The principle of total abstinence from all intoxicating liquor is one pillar. It suddenly arose, fair and beautiful, and even now is enveloped with some rays of millennial glory. The doctrine that all slaveholding is a sin is another pillar, standing firm, awfully grand, and immovable. The doctrine of the absolute inviolability of human life is another. This is in a state of preparation, but it will soon ascend, and stand brightly and majestically in its place. And thus principle after principle will be established, column after column will be erected, till the spiritual house of the Lord shall be established in the tops of the mountain, and we shall expand upon the eye of the beholder, far more beautiful than the Parthenon. And what then will be wanting? Only that the nations, in the language of prophecy, shall flow into it, only that the people should occupy it and rejoice in it. And this is millennial glory. But, unless you have firm, unchangeable, immutable principles, it will be like a certain house that was built upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Objection to Extremely difficult, if not impossible. The practice of non-resistance, if not impossible for the great majority of Christians, is certainly extremely difficult, even for the most advanced. It seems like overstraining duty. It is urging on men so much more than they feel able to perform, that multitudes will faint under the burden and abandon Christianity altogether as a system wholly beyond their reach. It is unwise to require what must discourage so many thousands from attempting anything at all, as avowed disciples of Christ. Answer. Who is to be the judge of what is possible, God or man? Who is to judge what and how much shall be required, Jesus Christ or his disciples? Are we to set at naught a duty because it seems to us difficult of performance? Are we to doubt that God's grace is sufficient for the weakest of his trusting children, to enable them to perform any duty he may lay upon them? Are we to accommodate divine truth and duty to the convenience of our fellow men in order to multiply superficial disciples? Are we to pare down and fritter away the requirements of our Heavenly Father for fears of discouraging and driving off half-hearted professors? Who is it that presumes to daub with such untempered mortar? He must be a most dangerous latitudinarian. Is this the way in which Christ and his apostles built up the church amid the violence of a contemptuous and persecuting world? Would it be any great misfortune to Christianity if nine-tenths of its present worldly-minded professors, convinced of the truth of the non-resistance doctrine, should honestly declare to the world, since this is Christianity, we cannot consistently profess to adhere to it, as its cross is greater than we are willing to bear? Would not the world at that moment be nearer its conversion than now? But why need we hold this language? God reigns, and not man. He declares the law of perfect rectitude through his Son. That Son is the head of every man, the Lord and Master of all true disciples. He has enjoined the practice of non-resistance on his professed followers as their indispensable duty. He has promised to be with and aid them to the end of the world. If so, let us say at once, whether we believe in Christ or not. 
whether we will endeavour to follow him and keep his sayings, or not, whether we will try to do our duty, confiding in the proffered strength of heaven, or not. If we will be Christians, let us try with all our might to do our duty, and see how far we shall be left to fall short. Let men earnestly try to carry out Christian non-resistance with this full purpose of heart, and though they may experience the pain of the cross sometimes, they will soon rejoice in a crown of triumph. It is difficult always to do right in this, as it is in respect to other departments of duty, and no more so. There is no virtue which does not involve some painful and almost overwhelming trials. If we were to cast off all obligations that ever required the hazard of mortal life, we should reject every single commandment of the living God. For there is not one that has not had its martyrs, and also its apostates, under great temptation. But to the faithful, how blessed is even death itself, if duty obliges the sacrifice! And to the obedient, the willingly cross-bearing, how true is it that Christ's yoke is easy, and his burden light! It is only for us to resolve that we will try. All things are then found possible, which are right. And what is there so discouraging to the humble and upright soul? Did not Jesus live and die the glorious exemplar of his own non-resistant precepts? Did not his apostles? Did not the primitive Christians for more than two centuries? Have I not brought up a host of witnesses, practically illustrating that under the most adverse circumstances, it was generally even safer to carry out non-resistance principles than their opposite? Behold robbers looked out of countenance and actually converted, Ferocious banditti rendered harmless, wild savages inspired with permanent kindness, and all manner of evil overcome with good. Am I to be asked after all this, what would you do if a robber should attack you, if an assassin should threaten your life, if a mob should break forth upon you, if a tribe of savages should beset your dwelling, if a foreign army should come against your land, if lawless soldiers should deal death and rapine about your neighborhood? What would I do? If I did right, if I acted the Christian part, the wise and noble part, I should adhere to my non-resistance principles, and ten to one experience the most signal deliverances, and achieve the most glorious of all victories, in the conquest of my own passions and those of my assailants. Hollowness of the Objection But the extreme hollowness of the objection before us becomes at once obvious, when I turn the tables, and demand whether the practice of injurious resistance offers immunity from extreme trial, danger, hardship, and suffering. How happens it that human beings enough to people from eighteen to forty such globes as ours have perished in war? How happens it that blood enough has been shed by the sword to fill a harbor that would embosom at quiet anchor the combined navies of the world? Do these tremendous facts indicate that resistance is sustained without hardships, distresses, and mortal agony? Let us contemplate the scenes of a single battle. Passage of the Tron. In 1809, in the campaign of Aspern and Wagram, Messina added to his own former renown, and was one of the firm props of Napoleon's empire on those fiercely fought battlefields. Previous to the Battle of Aspern, after the Battle of Ekmel, while Bonaparte was on the march for Vienna, chasing the Archduke before him, Massena had command of the advance guard. Following hard after the retreating army of the Archduke, as he had done before in Italy, he came at length to the river Tron, at Ebersburg, or Ebersdorf, a small village on its banks, just above where it falls into the Danube. Here, for a while, an effectual stop seemed put to his victorious career, for this stream, opposite Ebersburg, was crossed by a single, long, narrow wooden bridge. From shore to shore, across the sandbanks, islands, etc., it was nearly half a mile, and a single narrow causeway traversed the entire distance to the bridge which itself was about sixty rods long. Over this half-mile of narrow path, the whole army was to pass, and the columns to charge, for the impetuous torrent could not be forded. But a gate closed the further end of the bridge, while the houses filled with soldiers enfiladed the entire opening, and the artillery planted on the heights over it commanded every inch of the narrow way. The high rolling ground along the river was black with the masses of infantry, sustained by terrific batteries of cannon, all trained on that devoted bridge, apparently enough in themselves to tear it in fragments. To crown the whole, an old castle frowned over the steam, on whose crumbling battlements cannon were so planted as to command the bridge. As if this were not enough to deter any man from attempting the passage, 
another row of heights over which the road passed rose before the first covered with pine trees affording a strong position for the enemy to retire to if driven from their first thus defended thirty-five thousand men supported by eighty cannon waited to see if the french would attempt to pass the bridge even the genius of massena might have been staggered at the spectacle before him it seemed like marching his army into the mouth of the volcano to advance on the awful batteries that commanded that long narrow bridge it was not like a sudden charge over a short causeway but a steady march along a narrow defile through a perfect tempest of balls but this was the key to vienna and the marshal resolved to make the attempt hoping that lannes who was to cross some distance further up would aid him by a movement on the enemy's flank the austrians had foolishly left four battalions on the side from which the french approached these were first attacked and being driven from their positions were forced along the causeway at the point of the bayonet and on the bridge followed by the pursuing french but the moment the french column touched the bridge those hitherto silent batteries opened their dreadful fire on its head it sank like a sandbank that caves under the torrent to advance seemed impossible but the heroic cohorn flinging himself in front cheered them on and they returned to the charge driving like an impetuous torrent over the bridge amid the confusion and chaos of the fight between those flying battalions and their pursuers the austrians on the shore saw the french colours flying and fearing the eruption of the enemy with their friends closed the gate and poured their tempest of cannon-balls on friend and foe alike the carnage then became awful smitten in front by the deadly fire of their friends and pressed behind with the bayonets of their foes those battalions threw themselves into the torrent below or were trampled under foot by the steadily advancing column amid the explosion of ammunition wagons in the midst blowing men into the air and crashing fire of the enemy's cannon the french beat down the gate and palisades and rushed with headlong speed into the streets and village but here met by fresh battalions in front and swept by a destructive cross-fire from the houses while the old castle hurled its storm of lead on their heads these brave soldiers were compelled to retire leaving two-thirds of their number stretched on the pavement but massena ordered up fresh battalions which marching through the tempest that swept the bridge joined their companions and regaining the village stormed the castle itself along the narrow lanes that led to it the dead lay in swaths and no sooner did the mangled head of the column reach the castle walls than it disappeared before the dreadful fire from the battlements as if it sunk into the earth strengthened by a new reinforcement the dauntless french returned to the assault and battering down the doors compelled the garrison to surrender the austrian army however made good their position on the pine-covered ridge behind the village and disputed every inch of ground with the most stubborn resolution the french cavalry now across came out at a plunging gallop through the streets of the village trampling on the dead and dying and amid the flames of the burning houses and through the smoke that rolled over the pathway hurried on with exulting shouts and rattling armour to the charge still the austrians held out till threatened with a flank attack they were compelled to retreat there was not a more desperate passage in the whole war than this massena was compelled to throw his brave soldiers whether dead or wounded into the stream to clear a passage for the columns whole companies falling at a time they choked up the way and increased the obstacles to be overcome these must be sacrificed or the whole shattered column that was maintaining their desperate position on the further side be annihilated it was an awful spectacle to see the advancing soldiers amid the most destructive fire themselves pitch their wounded comrades while calling out most piteously to be spared by scores and hundreds into the torrent le grand fought nobly that day amid the choked-up defile and deadly fire of the batteries he fearlessly pressed on and in answer to the advice of his superior officer deigned only the stern reply room for the head of my columns none of your advice and rushed up to the very walls of the castle the nature of the contest and the narrow bridge and streets in which it raged gave to the field of battle the most horrid aspect the dead lay in heaps and ridges piled one across the other mangled and torn in the most dreadful manner by the hoofs of the cavalry and the wheels of the artillery which were compelled to pass over them twelve thousand men thus lay heaped packed and trampled together while across them was stretched burning rafters and timbers which wrung still more terrible crises and shrieks from the dying mass even bonaparte when he arrived shuddered at the appalling sight and turned with horror from the scene the streets were one mass of mangled bleeding trampled men overlaid with burning ruins 
American Review. Such was one of the world's ten thousand bloody conflicts. Suppose all the courage and endurance displayed on this horrible occasion could be brought into the service of peace and non-resistance. Should we hear any more of the extreme difficulty, if not impossibility, of carrying out the doctrine? Suppose these soldiers to have been devoted Christian non-resistance, scattered over the whole earth, and suppose them exposed to all the robberies, assaults, and batteries, abuses, injuries, and insults, by any means likely to fall to their lot, and then let the objector tell us how much harder their service would be in the army of the Prince of Peace than that of the Prince of Murderers. The truth is, men can endure almost anything they choose. What they have endured as the servants of sin is a proof of what they are capable of enduring for righteousness's sake. The latter service requires not a thousandth part of the physical and mental suffering of the former. How flimsy, then, is the objection we are considering. Let it never be repeated by any man calling himself a Christian. A true heart, a sound principle of action, and a conscientious will, can never find Christian non-resistance either an unattainable or an unsupportable virtue. End of chapter 6 